It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Alex, Renee, and Andy are all here. Lots to talk about. Actually, there's very little to talk about, but we we will talk about Apple rumors. Why isn't there a folding iPhone, the next generation MacBook Pro, uh, and um, also Apple's uh, intent with news? It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 651, recorded Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. Lube for your cube. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, providing effective training with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash macbreak to take advantage of their lowest prices of the season. For additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription, use the code MACBREAK30 at checkout. And by Eero. Never think about Wi-Fi again when you can have brilliant, hyper-fast, super-simple Wi-Fi with Eero. Visit Eero.com slash MACBREAK and get $100 off the Eero base unit, two beacons package, and one year of Eero Plus when you enter the code MACBREAK at checkout. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yep, it's that easy. For an extra three months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple with Renee Ritchie from iMore and the Vector Podcast. Hello, Renee. Hello, Leo. It's smashing to be back with you again this week. It's it's lovely. Smashing. Lovely to have you, sir. Andy Anako from Boston Public Radio, WGBH. Hello, Nako. Hi. Lovely Hi. to be here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I, I thought I'd try out the single Isaac, not the double Isaac. Hi. <laughs> and on. from the Pixel Core, Mr. Alex Lindsay. Hello, hello. It's the full team today. Welcome. <laughs> Good to have you all here. Google reveals high severity flaw in Mac OS kernel. Dum, dum, dum. Google's Project Zero, which is the security team out there, man, they find stuff everywhere, uh, discovered this more than 90 days ago, told Apple Apple has not fixed it. So in uh, concert, you know, with the uh, responsible disclosure rules, after 90 days, we're going to tell everybody. They're like and as good as an Eastern European teenage hacker team, it feels like. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, they got this guy, Travis, who's really yeah. quite good. Um, so... It apparently has to do with the copy on write behavior in the OS 10 kernel. Uh, and what's happening is it so it, if a user mounted file system, for instance, with disk utility, you mount a file system, is modified, Apple's kernel does not notify the virtual management subsystem that it's been modified. So it's loading stuff in into RAM or memory uh, with file mappings, it does, not only with anonymous memory, but after the destination process has started reading from the memory area due to memory pressure, pages holding the transfer memory can be evicted from the page cache. Okay, we need them back. They load them in, but that file system has been changed, hasn't, and of course it's been changed maliciously, still trusted, gets loaded in, and then your troubles begin. So according to Project Zero, if an attacker can mutate an on-disk file without informing the virtual management subsystem, this is a security bug. They informed Apple in November. The company has not fixed it. Uh, but according to Neo, when Apple has accepted the problem, in other words, they're not saying, oh, no, it's not a problem. They said, yeah, yeah. And we're working with Project Zero to patch a future release. Um now, what's the reason I bring this up is once that 90 days has passed, it's typical for researchers like Project Zero to put sample code out, and they have. So now, all of a sudden, uh, anybody who's interested can say, oh, this is how you do it. And that's then it becomes an issue because it's unpatched. Now... I don't know how hard it is to modify and mount a file image, you know, how to get somebody to do that. But my guess is, um, you know, any malicious software installed in your system could do it, would be my guess. So this is potentially very risky. 
Yeah, is there anything else to say about it except, you know, I don't know. No, I mean it's the same yeah. it's the same story with Project Zero. It's that, you know, they're they're flagging major operating systems like Linux or OS ten or sorry, Mac OS or Windows. And these companies all want to fix this stuff. They have their list of priorities that they go through and they try to fix them as fast as they can. And they'd argue that sometimes they need more time. And Google has set its line in the sand. So we're gonna see this from time to time when when you know a, a vendor simply can't get it done on time. And I have mixed feelings on it. I love the idea that the that there is an absolute time limit because it really puts pressure on to fix it. But there are going to be some cases where ginormous, like not just every like small little bit, but ginormous vendors just can't get it done in time. And then you risk this being in the wild. Uh, and I, I have heard that they try to negotiate with them and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it seems lately it never does. So, I mean, uh, either you want Google to have a little bit more flexibility or you like the fact that there is an absolute line in the sand. I'm, I'm sort of in the middle on it. I, I think it would be valuable if they would sometimes, if they knew that a thing was coming like, oh, it's four days till patch Tuesday, you know, maybe give Microsoft those four days. Um, but otherwise, I think it's a good policy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not just Google's, by the way. 90 days is kind of standard in the security community. Yeah. The theory is we aren't going to be the only people who find this. Absolutely. And so since we found it, it's presumed others might have already found it or that they may find it. So it's this is responsible disclosure. We're going to tell the company, we're going to give them a chance to fix it. But after a certain period of time, and this is what you debate about, well, what, what should that period of time be? After a certain period of time, we have to go public with this so that people know of the risk. And and that is considered by the security community. Ninety days is considered to be the normal. And there's amount no of time. there's yeah. no way for them to know the complexity because like some things might be trivial, almost trivial for the company to fix, and some things well like, that's true. Not even in, intuitively might be a nightmare because it creates a cast like all this stuff for ten years has been built on this bug, and now it fixed like there was a Saf famous Safari bug where they fixed that bug and it broke literally almost everything else because everyone had assumed that bug was normal behavior, and there's no way for a company like Google to know that. And there have been many problem. cases where companies have just said, "Nah, we're not going to fix it," and that's when response. <laughs> disclosure really does mandate well we got to tell people but there maybe should be some leeway for a company that's like in this case apple says oh gosh yeah we're working on it and then give us a little more time because this is a complicated fix andy go ahead i'm sorry well no just uh, my only comment was that there is such a thing as the, as the trust chain where uh, at some point people have to understand, even if there's no fix, that they probably shouldn't trust this element of an operating system uh, or this element of yeah. a system. Uh, I mean, this story reminded me of uh, the story about uh, uh, about the Apollo moon landings, where if uh, if <laughs> if they successfully landed on the moon, and now they're zipping up like the last part of the of the uh, <laughs> of the EVA suit, like it's just a, a zippered overcoat, doesn't hold anything in, it's just like a protective overcoat, and the the tab on the zipper breaks off they have to assume that the entire suit is compromised because if this thing is broken what else could be broken in this suit which means that now you can't have two people doing an eva which means that you can't have a single person doing eva on their own which means that because of this one little tab you because of the disastrous consequences if something goes wrong with this operation that means that suddenly the entire eva is scrapped assuming that the astronaut does not on on his own <laughs> fail to tell <laughs> mission controller that that what has happened and decides to fix it with a paperclip so that that's but that's the sort of thing that we're talking about where at some point there's value in simply knowing that by the way if you're assuming that this part of this system is secure do not make that assumption uh, but you're absolutely right in that uh if one person has found it, it's not, necess it's not necessarily true that other people have. Uh, no one has said that they've seen any sort of an exploit for this out in the field, which would have been a totally different thing to worry about. Uh, but that means that we could worry about, for instance, a government uh, knowing about this and keeping again not wanting to tell anybody about it. Uh, so it's, there, it is a complex argument, but at some point, if your if your if your SEAL Team Six uh, version of secure security team, if you decide that your job is to make everything safer and more secure, then the ability of Apple to fix this within 90 days is their problem and not yours. Your responsibility, as you choose to define it, is to make sure that people know that something is safe or something is not safe. Yeah, I hate to be completely inflexible, but. Uh you know, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 complicated, it's, but I, it's I, complicated. I, cer I, yeah. I certainly see their point of view. Yeah, and somebody asked, well, does Google ever does the uh, Project Zero ever report on Google flaws? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure it was originally created, in fact, for Google to police its own security issues. And uh, but these guys are so good. Travis Kalanick 
has found so many significant flaws. If you ever listen to Security Now, you'll hear his name come up all the time. And many of the flaws he comes up with are devious as heck. This is yep. fairly devious. Um, it's it's easy. I, I, this is not like the uh, group FaceTime flaw. This is something right. that you got some. You you know, this would be hard to detect ahead of time. So. Yeah, I had. I can't tell you how many times I had to read the story and other people uh, and analyze the story before I even felt as though I begin to understand what the hell is going on with this. Yeah. And that's what that's what, that's why we have experts in security absolutely <laughs> doing nothing but focusing I didn't, on this. I didn't do justice to it, but uh, the idea is you know, you know, kind of a broader brush mm -hmm. is you're loading in something, you assume it's safe, and then a bad guy changes it and there's no notification it's been changed and you continue to load it and it turns out now it's not safe. And uh, that it would be, you know, that's a hard thing to find. And remember, yeah. you order uh, your drive through and then they replace the guy behind the window after you pay, but before you get your food. Yeah, with the evil, <laughs> evil seven Arola <laughs> yes. who is putting arsenic in it. You know, you yep. go, oh, no. There, that's good. That's an analogy. I just want my burger and you don't think about it. <laughs> and remember, they don't have Apple's source code, I don't think. So they're doing this, uh, you know, kind of reverse engineering everything. Well, I bet you Steve Gibson will talk about it later on security now. Mm. Uh, and as long as we're uh, talking about flaws, we might as well stay in that. Um, a researcher, we talked about this, I think, about a month ago, uh, Linus Hensa, uh, said he found a Mac OS keychain security hole, and uh, he wasn't going to tell Apple <laughs> because he was mad uh, that his work would go unpaid. You know, there's no bug bounty for this. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a bug bounty for iOS, but apparently not for yeah. Mac OS. So he said, well, I'm not going to tell you. Well, uh, Apple apparently uh, approached him and said, look, <laughs> uh, uh, let's let's talk. Let's figure it out. And I guess they have at least worked it out uh, to the point that he's sharing details with Apple, but not yet promised any money uh, for it. Apple's always been... They are um, working on it. They are working on the Mac Bounty program. I don't know why they haven't announced it yet. It's been ridiculously long since they announced the iOS one. And as far as I know, they've been working on the Mac one since they announced the iOS one. So it's yeah. it's beyond weird. I kind of understood it's Apple's really... position that if we start paying people to find bugs, it just uh, it just inflates the value because then we're bidding against national so, But they pay low. And, it's, just, but, it's like a, a good Samaritan fee, basically. you got to do it because... No but, then, but, it's, yeah. Yeah. but paying bounties at, in this current culture is what will make the system more secure because there are companies that make money off of security flaws that are paying lots and lots of money for these things. So if they don't want people to find a, find a bug and then say, I can either get nothing by reporting this to Apple or I could get $150,000 by reporting it to this company that is that special, a security company whose job is penetrating phones and penetrating systems uh, at the bidding of in, private individuals and foreign governments, if they don't want that to happen, they are going to have to at least put some skin in the game. They don't have to necessarily uh, top the highest bid, but there are people that spent weeks, months developing this who, who don't see it as anything else than I can either have a Tesla or I can continue to, to driving my old Prius. Which do I want, depending on what I do with this with this work that I've done? And I think a lot of them just need something that they consider fair. I don't, I don't think you need to necessarily yeah, exactly. compete with um, nation states. But I think that, I mean, if, if you do you are competing, you can't. You can't. But I think that, but if you said we're going to pay 25000 or 50000 or whatever uh, for it, you know, because the other thing is what you want is a handful of people who are really smart to spend their their whole make day it worth thinking their about it yeah. and, and right. working on it. And if they can make hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year uh, figuring out, you know, saving you millions in possible losses, it's worth it. Yeah. I love I love this story. A 19-year-old Argentinian, he self-taught. He taught himself online from online courses, had a program. He is the first millionaire through Hacker One bug <laughs> bounties. Uh, he has made $1 million in bug bounties. That's awesome. Isn't that great? And he's a kid, and, and he's a self-taught kid. He didn't go to college. He didn't you know, he didn't, I guess, didn't have the money to do it. He just kind of fell in love with technology. He does now. Maybe he can go back to college now. Yeah, now. He, he was inspired, <laughs> oddly enough, by the 1995 film Hackers, which only inspired me to nausea, but apparently... Oh, he, boy. <laughs> I wish I'd been sneakers. <laughs> sneakers, at <laughs> least, right? Uh, so, and he I learned mean, to hack by people... watching free online tutorials and reading blogs. He got his first bug bounty when he was 16... 
uh, and he chose the uh, Twitter handle try underscore two underscore hack to keep himself motivated. He's been hacking after school. He now does it full time and earns 40 times the average software engineer salary in Buenos Aires. <laughs> I love it. So one of the, like, I know there are some people who really dislike the idea of the bounty programs. The way I try to look at it is this. You have good Samaritans who will just stumble across bugs like the FaceTime bug, you know, and give you back your wallet. And then maybe you'll give them a few bucks because it's nice, you know, to reward good Samaritan activities. You have your police, which are like the red teams at the various companies that respond. They find their own bugs. They respond to them. They seek out the offenders. And then it's, but it's also good to have these, like these people out there who are just looking for them, like consultants, like experts, who you'll like, you know, they they know that you will compensate them if they if you bring them good work. And it's not like they're gonna sell it to the mob if you don't give them something, but it's just it's better to have a wide and diverse network of people out there. It's better for everybody in the end. Hacker One has actually become made a business out of this. They've got tutorials and online videos yeah. that teach you how to do fuzzing and look other techniques. And they have handed out now nineteen million dollars in bug bounties. Nineteen million. And one million to that one guy. One million to that one guy. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, there are many many hackers who are actually now making a, a living. And uh, this is of course uh, highlighting the problem of the word hackers, which implies a bad guy. But it doesn't. It isn't. In fact, it's just somebody who likes to hack on code. And uh, many hackers are not bad guys. So so they or, or girls or women or women. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Should say that. Yep. Uh, in fact, software engineers, uh, you might be interested to hear this. This is kind of a sea change in Apple. Apple is now hiring more software engineers than hardware engineers. I'm kind of surprised that that just happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, this comes from a data-driven site called ThinkNum. Software and services job listings have outnumbered hardware engineering listings since the third quarter of last year. So, but that's, this is the new Apple. Yeah. Again, uh, electrons are a lot easier to manipulate and distribute than, than molecules. So that's where the future of the company is going. Well, and also once you build the molecules, uh, there's just a lot of different things you want to do with the electrons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we didn't the mention this not the atoms. last week, but the one division you don't want to work for at Apple is the uh, self-driving car. Uh, they've laid off a big chunk of uh, employees um, last week. It's, it's hard to know whether that's a, that's related to them scaling down or just changing direction. You know, in fact, Apple says changed, it's a reorg. It's a change of direction, yeah. but they also, I don't know if it technically can be called a layoff because those people are being put into other orgs. Yeah, exactly. Right. And also remember that a lot of the research that they're doing in self-driving cars is so applicable in things like augmented reality. You're talking about a thing that is moving throughout real space and being able to having to analyze visual input on a very, very quick basis and then make decisions based on that. That is something that if you were able to build a pair of goggles, you would be able to put that software very, very nicely into a pair of goggles. So I should point out that these are actual layoffs that I'm sure there are many oh, okay. hundreds of other people people who will be moved from the division to another division. But Apple filed this with the California Employment Development Department saying uh, oh, by, by April we will be yeah. firing uh, 38 engineering program managers, 33 hardware engineers, 31 project and design engineers, and 22 software engineers uh, on April 16th. Yeah, you have to file that if you're going to do a layoff. If, and I don't know if we know what, the, the t what that percentage is of the team either. We don't. And we nor do we times. know how many other hundreds have been moved to different divisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, yeah. and remember that, sorry. I mean, layoffs are, for most of these companies, is a house cleaning it's project. A project. Well, yeah. It's a fraction. Well, it's a house cleaning yeah. project as well. I mean, you find that there's a lot of people that you hired that didn't really turn out. Right. Hi, let, letting go each one of them on their own is a legal liability, whereas laying off a bunch of them is something that you can do as a, well, we're making a reorg and we're, we're just Yeah, that's why it. you file this. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And also remember when this story first broke, I think from the Wall Street Journal, they had a lot of details about people who had been hired specifically from the, the automotive industry. Uh, so the of people who, I guess, you know how to make uh, how to make suspensions and how to uh, do the ECR boxes, things that are very, very automotive specific that maybe are not necessarily 
important now if Apple has decided that they much rather build software for other companies cars or if they've decided that the, the technology they've developed is more for fleet operations than for personal vehicles so as as usual given that Apple hasn't really <laughs> given that we have no idea exactly what was inside uh, that part of the company it's hard to hard to speculate but yeah that that is new I thought that the last time that they meant that that was in the news it was they were specifically specifically saying that they're more moving peop, engineers from one division to to another division, but this time if they're saying that they're layoffs, that's my understanding, that's interesting. and it ha uh, is the way the companies work. And I've heard this from both Apple and Google, and it might just be a Silicon Valley thing: is that you you're given your notice, and then you have certain number of weeks to find another group that's willing to take you on. And if that group takes you on, then nothing ha like you just basically move groups. And if it doesn't, then you have then you're technically out of the company, and you can reapply for another position. Yeah, that, I'm sure that they do the that. I'm sure they give like. them a chance to look at other lists things within yeah. the company yeah and perhaps give them an, you know a head a head start yeah we also have no idea how many people are are working on apple projects that are actually employed by contractors that right. apple does not have yeah. to file paperwork for so right right well you know we're just look reading the tea leaves that's all we do here apple doesn't tell us <laughs> anything. Monology. we just have to read the tea leaves let's take a little break come back with more uh including usb4 Get ready. Ooh. Just when you Four thought it was fun. <laughs> safe to get a USB cord. USB 4. Our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. I uh, I feel like a certain affinity for these guys. Uh, uh, I first oh. met uh, Tim and Don at uh, NAB at the NAB conference where we did a panel on uh, IPTV and, uh, you know, using the Internet f for as we do for uh, content. And I think Tim and Don were kind of inspired. They were, at the time, IT trainers in a traditional setting with a classroom. And, you know, you, you teach people. The reason you have these, of course, is because if you want to get into the IT business, often even a degree isn't what you need. What you need are certifications that say, yes, you know, Leo knows this. Leo knows that. You've, you're an MCSE or you're an ISC squared. You don't have an A-plus certificate or you have a a certified ethical hacker certificate. Those are the things to get that first job that are very valuable, often a requisite for getting the job. And so they they were doing great doing that, but they saw what we were doing with Twit and the, and a light, I guess a light bulb went off and uh, Tim Broom and Dom Pezzett started IT Pro TV. And the whole idea there is they've got five studios now, by the way, they've completely surpassed us, is to do the same kind of engaging, fun content, including chat rooms and on the air quizzes and stuff, but to do it for IT training. And what a success it has been. They started advertising with us very early on. And and I have to say, I've watched them soar. They really are doing great. IT Pro TV has the best trainers, experts in the field. A lot of IT teams use IT Pro TV for their teams, to not to give them certs necessarily, but to keep their skills up. 4,000 hours of on-demand training at IT Pro TV. And uh, now you can see the members of the team growing 100,000 plus. They just crossed 100,000 plus IT Pro TV learners. It is a massive success. And partly because it is the most affordable, most engaging way to learn the skills you need. A standard membership is $28.50. I'm going to tell you, I can make it a lot more affordable, but $28.50 a month. Premium membership, which includes not just the uh, the classes, but also labs where you can you don't even have to have a Windows machine to be able to actually set up Windows servers and configure clients. Uh, and practice exams, too. So if you're getting ready for those IT certs, that's great. That, the, up, the premium membership, is $42 a month. But right now, I'm happy to say IT Pro TV is still honoring the special offer we've had since they started with us, 30% off for Twit listeners. And that is not just for a week or a month or a year. That's forever, as long as you stay active. That means that the standard membership is under $20 a month. You are not going to find this kind of training anywhere for that price. Or $200 a year. The premium membership now, just $29.50 a month or $295 a year. This is cheaper even than just buying the books to do the studying. This And it's so much more fun. You can watch on the big screen TV. They support, they have iOS and Android apps, but they support Chromecast. They have a Roku app, an Amazon Fire TV app, really nice Apple TV app. Of course, you can watch streaming on your PC too. So, you know, you can have it on the big screen while you're eating breakfast, hop in the car, listen on the way in, keep it as a picture-in-picture -picture on your screen during work. 
imagine how quickly you will learn the skills you need. Episodes are recorded live every day, Monday through Friday. In their five studios, they go from studio to web in 24 hours, so they always have the freshest training. By the way, it's kind of cool. CompTIA now uses IT Pro TV as their official video training partner. That means they've got 12 CompTIA on-demand courses. They've got the CompTIA A+, Network+, Plus, and Security+, Plus certs. So um, they're just going great guns. I want you to visit them right now. Go.itpro.tv slash MacBreak. Get started with your standard or premium membership. This is the time to get that job in IT you've always wanted or to keep your job or get a better job with the training from IT Pro TV. Go.itpro.tv slash MacBreak. And if you wanted that 30% off, don't forget to use the offer code MacBreak30 at checkout. MacBreak30. IT Pro TV is flexible training, binge worthy content, life changing results. And I'm very proud of the success that uh, they have achieved. USB 4.0. <laughs> you know, I, I, in a way, I bring this up on uh, MacBreak Weekly because we wouldn't probably have USB if Steve Jobs with the iMac, the very first iMacs, had said, hadn't said, and we're going to support USB. I mean, that was a big part of it. We're not going to build in a floppy. Some, Apple, some weird Apple connector. Yeah, we're going to yeah. support it. And then suddenly we had to figure out how to get all our ADB keys to work. <laughs> that was, that was and Leo, this us. comes on the this comes on the heels of them saying that USB, what is it, USB two and three are all USB three point one and three point two now. And well, that's a little just, confusing. In fact, thank goodness, the whole thing yeah. is. I Moore has written a uh, fabulous article, Jerry Hildenbrand, everything you He's need to best. know about USB four, better, stronger, faster, backward compatible, forty gigabits per second, so it competes with Thunderbolt three. In fact, it, it is Thunderbolt 3. It, it, it basically <laughs> carries Thunderbolt 3, right? Yeah. It's two-lane operation. USB 4 carries Thunderbolt 3. But uh, yes. you can use your Type-C cables. That's very good news. Um, so is it Thunderbolt 3? I mean, are they just renaming Thunderbolt? No, it's got to be more than that, right? Yeah, it's 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 a super I think it's a superset of Thunderbolt 3. Okay. But it does but it is compatible with. And if people are panicking, the numbers are the protocol, the bits that go over the wire, the letters are the plug type. So no one is taking your USB C cable, the one that you just yeah. finally got everyone to convert to, and making you get a, like an L shaped cable or anything. Yeah. It's the same ending as Thunderbolt three and USB C cables already. Yeah. Yeah, it just it just recently we got uh, USB USB 3.2. So now we have yes. to say we've got USB 3.2 extended to USB 4 over USB C. <laughs> at which point your friends compatible head with TB3. Yes. <laughs> Will there be at some point just this merging of standards so everything's Type C? The problem is that um, Thunderbolt is an Intel thing, and Intel, as we know, it has not had the greatest success bringing things to market recently. So everyone is still waiting on PCI. Is my understanding, and you know, I'm not an expert in this stuff, but my understanding is we have Thunderbolt three now, and it's an Intel thing, and we're waiting on PCI four so we can have Thunderbolt four, uh, but it's taking a while. And meanwhile, USB USB is doing its thing. And luckily, but confusingly, a lot of cables can carry both. <laughs> and apparently Intel has dropped the royalty or has somehow made it more open. Uh, Thunderbolt 3, yeah, it's open and royalty free. So that probably yeah. has a lot to do with it as well. Because who wants royalty-based connectors? I yeah, mean, there's some, the last if thing. you want something to be ubiquitous, yeah. make it open. If you, yeah. Like this just... Yeah. Feels like common sense. Hey, speaking of iMore, I didn't mention this, but um, I gather... Well, you tell me. Congratulations are in order. iMore was uh, acquired by Future. Yes. Yeah. So if people aren't familiar with Future, they have uh, T3 and Tech Radar and a bunch of paper publications because in Europe, that still makes a lot of sense. Uh, in, um, in America, they recently, I forget how long ago, a year ago, bought Perch, which had a NAND Tech and Tom's Guide and Tom's Hardware and Laptop Magazine. Um, and so in order to increase, I guess, their North American scope, they bought Mobile Nations, which was a proprietor. Like, you know, it was started by Marcus Adelson back in the days of Visor Central, and he kept it all these years. I guess he finally decided it was better to be bigger. So he sold, he and his partners sold to um, to Future. And now we're all all one big happy family. Is it going to change Does anything this, uh, from your point of view? It's com We're running completely as mobile nations for at least a year because they're, I, as far as I know, they're still busy with like, you know, doing all their stuff. So it's not going to change anything for now. And if you look at Anantech and and um, Tom's Guide and Tom's Hardware, they've been with Future for a year and I can't see anything that's no, changed. they've gotten better if anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
So um, hopefully, I mean, you know, I, it, it's new, it's new people, so I can never say never. But as far as I can tell, nothing, nothing has changed with any of their properties. Probably so the far. best known future property, one of their earliest, is Maximum PC Magazine. I think yeah. a lot of people are familiar with Mac that. Mac Life, maybe did, people they, remember. Three yeah. D World. Um, long time I remember. Ago, I they do a guitar player magazine. Yeah, three um, world. There it is. They're smart to kind of go digital, and they, a lot of their properties are full, are one hundred percent digital. Yeah, a um, lot of photo stuff, digital photographer, um, photography, guitar world. stuff. It's a huge range. Yeah, this reminds me a lot of the old Ziff Davis, where uh, they were originally like sailing magazines right. and all, all yeah. sorts of other uh, stuff too. <laughs> all these specialty uh, magazines. Uh, but mag, I don't know how what the future for magazines is. So uh, it's smart of them. Anyway, I just thought. You're you're the news this week. <laughs> <I> thought, <laughs> Thank you. I, I thought I'd this mention is, it. This is going to be like Marvel movies, where now the Spider-Man movie has to involve Tony Stark somehow because you have to make sure that you you promote the next movie. Well, I did ask Ryan from an if he was going to benchmark me. He said no, but he is going <laughs> to overclock me, and I don't think anybody is looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, they even it looks like they even do um, conferences, right? They're going to do the video show. That's awesome. Yeah. Where, when and where is the video show? At the NEC in 2019, everything the budding filmmaker, professional videographer, vlogger, or online content creator needs to expand their moving image production Where's horizons. I'm not familiar with the NEC. It's probably something br British. Uh, but that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, who who is it that bought uh, um, uh, VidCon and... Uh, uh, is well, it Viacom? Know. One of the big, I think it was Viacom bought VidCon. Uh, VidCon is a big YouTube conference. And so there's clearly oh, a consolidation. It's in Birmingham. It's in Birmingham, Alabama? No, Birmingham. Oh, England. <laughs> the, the original Birmingham. Oh, oh, the one with the smoke <laughs> stacks. Yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, Viacom has uh, been acquiring a lot of these uh, digital properties as well. Uh, but I will Viacom say uh, congratulations to uh, the Mobile Nation's owners because in an era of rapidly self-destructing media companies, they managed to build a really, really yes. good business out of hard work and uh, yeah. and creators. Are they now out of, the, out of it? I mean, are they gone? No, they're staying on. They're staying on. Oh, uh, the same management team, everything. Good. So your life won't change dramatically? No, nope. Crackberry Kevin is still my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, vector and all that will continue on as well yep. i'm sure yeah because yep. we count on vector yeah oh thank you yeah uh it's a cha you know it's actually kind of apple's kind of part of that story i mean really is a changing world we know that or we think that according to john patchkowski and i think mark german confirmed apple's going to have a news an announcement uh later this month maybe the 25th although that's a monday so we think that's odd um but um Negotiations continue with publishers, and uh, Digiday had an article this week about publishers who are already on Apple News, and probably some of the texture publishers are, are also there as well, who are reporting that ad revenue is not great. It should be an Aaron Sorkin show, shouldn't it? I'd love to see all the behind the scenes on this stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, again. According if, to if Digiday, Apple's ad revenue is bogged down by advertisers' disinterest in the ad inventory publishers are selling directly. Um, and so in some cases, um, one source said their publication earned low five figures every month from Apple News. Another said they earned less than $1,000 a month. The biggest success, which is not good news for Apple, is the publishers that aren't full on Apple News. But Apple is throwing, like especially now with polit with political news, entertainment news, Apple is throwing so much traffic their way. That when you look at the numbers of referrals they're getting from yeah. Apple, it's ridiculous. And then it hits their own, their own. Either it hits their own, your subscriber, and it hits their own paywall, or it hits their own ad pile. And you know that. That's not great for subscribers who are going all in on Apple News, and it's not great for Apple News. So they're going to have to fix that, or everything is going to be to re <laughs> finish reading this article on the web. I mean, with CPMs in, of, as low as three and four dollars, uh, well, that's what it's like in YouTube too. For video. yeah, yeah or I mean, radio, <laughs> digital ads in general are horrible, like yeah. and declining. Yeah. Um, so I don't. 
that I mean, might it's a make it. I said Apple's terrible at doing. Well, according to the publishers, Apple's really bad at filling remnant stock or filling. Like you'll get like the one display ad, and if people aren't sure how this works, generally you'll have like the premium ads, and those are the ones that pay the best. But they have a, a number of times that they'll display, and then it's got to show something else because you're no longer no longer getting paid for that ad. So most publishers have a, a, a stack of different ads. Like you have it's the real big premium it's called ones. Remnant. Renman inventory. Yeah, and yeah. then either like Google, I think Google with Ad Exchange is one of the In biggest ones. In this case, it's NBC Universal. One. It's apparently selling the yes. Remnant. But those Remnant ads are generally the horrible ads that you see on the website, and Apple isn't <laughs> filling those. And so there's nothing. And even those ads are horrible, people click on them, and that generates revenue. So yeah. it's, yeah. Or they at least see them, right? I mean, you know, it's, yeah. I always think it's funny. I, whatever, I know whatever page I just went to when I go to speedtest.net because I get five ads that are all the same. So the oh. same thing. You know, <laughs> all about whatever. B&H. You know, it's usually yeah. all my B&H orders because yeah. I went to B&H yeah. first for something. So, Osmo Pocket. So um, the the point of this article, though, in fact, the headline is, is it's hard to back out. Even if you're not making the money you yeah. wanted, well, um, I, uh, you can't you can't back out either. Yeah, because I mean, the thing is they, they also need flow. I mean, uh, we were the, uh, the, everyone was talking about how Spotify was ruining Spotify and all these subscription services were ruining the music business, and now it's the majority of their income. In fact, their income is starting to go right. up. You know, as as people start to move and use these platforms, I think that they're going to find that they're making more money. But in the transition, sure, it doesn't make any sense uh, until enough people are doing it, until enough average folks are using it. Uh, it's it isn't going to make sense revenue. It's not the thing that you can lean on yet. But uh, but streaming uh, music has definitely gotten to a point where they can lean on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, each one of these types of media is unique, however, and Apple has to make sure that they're providing a product that the people who are buying this are going to be able to use. It's not just uh, Apple tends to ask for a lot of control over every any kind of service that they tie into. And sometimes with advertising in particular, the, the things that I'm hearing about from major publishers is largely that I need the information that I can get about my readership. I need to know what people are reading on my own site and what kind of, what kind of level of engagement there is. And they're not confident that they're, they're going to get that sort of stuff uh, off, off of Apple. And so, if if Apple if Apple is is negotiating from the, the position of we are an elite brand you are we are making you look so good you should be so happy that you're that we are associated with us that's not going to pay out in in the future they they dallied with advertising <laughs> earlier on that's the reason why we don't really think of Apple as an advertising company because they just didn't create a product that was useful to the marketplace I mean the pattern for all these publishers though that, that's dangerous is that you know the Hollywood decided they were going to stonewall uh, Netflix, and that has not turned out well for them. Uh, <laughs> you know, Spotify. You know, everyone's afraid that Spotify and Apple will eventually just cut the publishers out because they can. And eventually, you know, like if you look at Future, which just bought iMore, what if Apple says, okay, I give up and we'll just start buying these guys <laughs> you know, and just, you know, and filling the, you know, and then, and then Apple News becomes a whole lot of things that they can provide that are, that have all these verticals. The problem for, uh, if they decided that they were going to do that, uh, the problem for publishers is that, okay, now I now I have this thing that works and it's totally tied in, and, or I can try to survive outside of that ecosystem. So them pushing back too hard uh, just will lead these technical these tech companies to decide they need to do it themselves. Uh, it's I weird don't know too because that. we got like kind of hooked on the on the metrics because in the old days you know you you bought the newspaper you bought the magazine and they their demographic business was as big as their classified business they lived on all the addresses and information they had because they could sell those at, you know for huge marketing revenue but they also knew that every magazine and newspaper they sold were probably read by two people the magazine in the dentist office by like thirty people and they sort of padded the numbers to account for that and now we're seeing a digital equivalent of that where the article is going out to Apple but then being read by a billion people well, and there's no real way to pad for that i think that the thing is is that they they do need to find a way to i don't think that they apple needs to give them the information to be able to give them data and inf data of how many people are watching a certain article or being able to even notify the users if the users are if it's basically a publishing uh like an rss system where uh apple's you know a publisher says i've got a new article and your your app on your phone is securely asking for are there new articles from the New York Times? Apple doesn't have to connect the two of you together to give them some of what they need, you know, for that for that process. They can anonymize it and and then, and then allow it to you know that information to kind of go back and forth without 
uh, breaking that up, much like Apple Pay doesn't really give you give the <laughs> anybody a lot of information either. And they so have the number they just don't know how. Yeah, who and so it is. and so the thing is, is that but there's a lot of data that you can get when I'm trying to figure out. You know, I I know a little bit of the publishing, but in video, we want to we definitely want to have a lot of information, and we get that. I don't know anything about the actual users that are on the other side, but I know how many people were watching at a certain time. Um, I know when they left, when they entered. I can if I cross uh, if I cross that against other marketing processes, I start to get a lot of information about what is actually happening, uh, you know, on my video, and I make decisions about what part of videos are good and which parts we should do less of. Uh, so it's a lot of the information that they need. Now they'll say that they want those demographics because they want to resell those demographics. I mean, they, they they want those email lists and they want that stuff because a big part of their business is you know, reselling the list, which they're not getting from Apple and they're not going to get from Apple. And so that's obviously going to be frustrating. And I think that they find that if they, if they can back channel a bunch of complaints, they can try to pressure Apple to do it, which is why we're seeing this article, of course. And, uh, but, um, I don't think that they're going to get the data. I wanted to format this comment in a way that doesn't turn into another 30 minutes, but uh, what I think one of the bigger <laughs> problems is that a, a lot of what I've been hearing both in public and in private about Apple's upcoming offering is that it's very, very, it, it leans very, very heavily towards national news. And so much of what we consider news is very, very local or very, very specific. And so it's not going to be very, very helpful to have this sort of thing. Nonetheless, if I'm going to be opening up an app that's called news, I do want to know about what certain people in the federal government have been testifying against each other on. But I also want to know that there was a pack of coyotes spotted <laughs> in my town last night and that perhaps that's a good time <laughs> to like make sure that the cats don't get to go outside last night. But but even like local sports, even local politics, even local news, things are not really interesting to a national audience. Uh I like the fact that when I go to news.google.com, there is an actual pain for here is like that's that's where I found out that there was a pack of coyotes in my town that but I don't have cats, but still that's that's an interesting thing to to know. Uh, you have to be able to make sure that your service is going to be at, uh, of use to the person who's actually going to be reading it. And so that means that, the fact that you know exactly what kind of halter top a Kardashian was photographed in yesterday, that's not of much interest to me. But I really want to know if there, if the uh, if the proposal to basically replace the entire sewer system in my part of town is going through or not. I want to know about that because it affects where I'm going to be able to park cars in four months. Well, but I, and, I, so, and I, I wonder if it's going to be a news if that's going to be a news organization. Like for for me, all of my information about my local community is from next door. You know, and 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 I get my little notifications all the time. Sometimes too many notifications. But but the uh, but next door is it's, oddly enough. A, there was a long discussion recently about the coyotes in the back of the behind the houses, <laughs> and um, and the fact that they were eating the turkeys, or people wanted them to eat the turkeys because there's a lot of turkeys here too. And uh, so the um, uh, but all of my information that I know about whether 37 was closed, whether there's rain, the police uh, the reports are often put up there. The the local meetings, like all the things that I would normally get from a from a from a uh, newspaper, uh, I feel like I get the parts that I really care about on on that one website. And so I th the question is, is, do we, you know, is that publishing, uh, does it all make sense or is it viable in a, in a place where I didn't even know what Nextdoor was until like six months ago. And, and then as soon as I said it, I found this thing called Nextdoor and everyone's like, yeah, yeah. We're, my my, my, my yeah. wife was like, yeah, I've oh, been on that for the welcome. last three years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, uh, just kind of like, it's kind of like how we figured this out, you know? And, uh, and, you know, and, and I think that it, what's interesting about it is, is that I think that the, the problem really for publishers is going to be the, the monodirectional fun function of their system, which is that they're not going back and forth. What makes Nextdoor really interesting uh, is that we're all discussing stuff all the time. You know, recently we've been discussing leashed dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's you know you're discussing stuff back and forth and the future is, of media I think is going to be a discussion not not a mono directional broadcast of in, of text uh, video audio whatever it's all going to be back and forth and these you know these publishers aren't ready for that they don't understand that at all well it's complete, I'm in the meetings with them it's complete <laughs> Uh, they don't, they don't it's get a complete it. change from what they do, which is yeah. they, they and tell it stories. It requires a completely different set of talents, a completely different set of reporters, a completely different like there's a it is like a complete 
that's, uh, it that's truly what is a paradigm shift. They don't want to change it. Yeah, they, well, it's yeah. terrifying for them. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. and, uh, I don't, you know, it's going to be a very hard transition. It's not going to be something that's easy. I've been thinking about this in the context of the Spotify, um, acquisition of Gimlet and, uh, anchor and, and their goals with podcasting. And, um, I think what I, what I think is that some people think of podcasts and Gimlet certainly does as kind of like TV shows. You make shows, yeah. they have seasons, they run for a period of time. Uh, the hosts aren't as important as the production values and the content, the stories they're telling. And honestly, that's not what we do. And it's not yeah. what I believe in. I, it, it, and it's a very, so this is the same thing where if you have that Hollywood mindset that we tell stories, you know, we make movie, you make a movie, we get everybody together, they make a movie, then they go away. And now we're going to make another movie then that's what you do with podcasting. And I think that's exactly the wrong thing to me. And maybe it's, again, it's my background in radio. I think, and it's certainly been the case for us, podcasting is not about the content as much as the conversation, yeah. as you said, about the people who are making, the hosts are far more important. It's a, uh, you know, we're not in show business, we're in people business. Right. And, and it is and, about conversation. And there's an authentic conversation among people who actually know what they're talking about. And if you want longevity, you know, this show's 15 years old. If you want... Right. something to go on and on and on. It's going to be about the people. Of course, the content has to be something you're interested in. If you're interested in Max, then this would be, or Apple, this would be an interesting show for you. But if you don't like the people, you're going to move on. Right. And if you don't like the conversation. And uh, yeah, and I think that that's a, you know, it's, it, was, it was said in the earliest days of the internet, people interpret the internet based on their bias, what they came from. So, you know, if you're a magazine publisher, you thought, oh, a great way to publish magazines. Well, and, and, if you're a video maker, it's, oh, a great way to publish videos. Yeah. And, and we, we find that uh, a lot of, you know, that we've had the opportunity to do 2,000 shows in the last, you know, 10 years, you know, for other people. And you watch this wide range of, you, when you work, anytime you work with someone in New York or Hollywood, you end up with this jam-packed show that has, we've got bumpers and sweepers and things, yeah, and then we're going to play yeah. out, we're going to do a play out, and then we're going to come back. Right. And, and, and it's so tight that there's no authentic communication, right. you know, and what we found- One person on stage is much more effective than the jazzy, jazzy produced- well, so, and when you start actually letting the audience, you know, because yeah, we, we love have, the we have an IRC, part, and well, like yeah. we we did a uh, we don't do that was always a challenge for me. I, one of the reasons we do shows live is because we want to make them interactive. Most people right. don't listen live though, so it's a really interesting challenge. For, it always has been yeah. for us. You know, I come from talk radio, which is fully interactive. Right, right. Well, and and they, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's a chicken or egg kind of thing. When people know that that well, you're going to have that, more and more people show up for the stuff that's live too. You know, it's a matter of audience. Uh, yeah, we thought that would happen. Well, it's the hard. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> the the because uh, people have lives. That's the other side of it. Right, right, right. Yeah. What? How yeah. dare they? <laughs> but I, I, you know, I always liked live radio because uh, you're it's live and you can call if you got a, something you call in and and well, and actually most people never call a radio show, but you feel like it's a conversation by proxy because and you feel like you could you could you could yes. call in you know and that's that's the you yeah. know it's, it's like the, it's like the lottery. Right. You know, it's like you could win if you if you right. actually played. So, uh, let's see other Apple news. Apparently, Apple, according to I Fix It, Apple has started uh, putting longer cables in their MacBook Pros. They never admitted that there were issues, but many had said, you know, these MacBook Pros fail after repeated opening and closing of the laptop. And in fact, it was dubbed FlexGate because of the flex display cables. Apple never said, oh, yeah, there's a problem. But I fix it notices the latest MacBook Pros have a longer cable. Yeah, well, that I, was so embarrassing. This is, it was, it, it was not, not only just, a, it was, seemed to be a very, very simple engineering failure, but also the fact that they decided to integrate this cable with the display itself meant that if someone came in with this problem, they said, okay, well, it's no problem. screen we'll just, for you. <laughs> exactly. 600 yeah. bucks. Thank you very much. Yep. This is, if you've never seen it, and I actually have never seen it, but that's, I probably don't open my laptop enough, but this is what the failure starts as, they call it the stage light effect, where you've got these kind of footlights coming up from the bottom yeah. of your screen. It's very theatrical. It, yeah. Once you see that, you know that your cable is failing and it's going to be a $700 replacement because they're not going to, as Andy says, you can't just fix the flex. Wah, wah. You have to fix the whole screen. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm I'm not gonna say dumpster fire in context with this design. It's not that but bad. It's there, there's smoke. There's reason for <laughs> take a look and see. Well, and this is you know I, honestly uh, every t every year you got to do something to improve your product, and sometimes it's something invisible like 
a slightly or longer cable. Something to, something to keep a $2,000 laptop from failing. Yeah, right. Um, anyway, just an update if you've had this it's problem. weird to me that, you know, like, again, like I was talking about this with Gruber last week that, you know, back, back in the day, Steve Jobs would run downstairs, throw the thing at somebody's head and say, why doesn't it work the way it should? <laughs> right. And seven months later, it'd be fixed. And we're going on like four years with this laptop. And like again, regardless of whether you like or dislike the design, the keyboard, anything, we can all agree that it ha it has the most divisive and most unhappy making yeah. MacBook in memory. And it's going on. Have you ever had your, your screen fail? No, I have. Have you? But not yes. not this way. But I've there is a there was another. I mean, I've had other laptops fail that way. I mean, I think that's a very common failure. The difference is, as Andy pointed out, other laptops they swap out a cable. Yeah, yeah. That, I had a twenty. There was a twenty twelve problem that was same same. Uh, it was a different issue, but it was the same thing. Where they, it, when you went to the Apple store, they were like, "Yeah, they all broke." You know, like they <laughs> they like like it's just a certain amount of there was a certain amount of time, and you just use it a certain period of time, and it just die. And of course, it was. In my, with my luck, it was more than three years after I bought it. So, it was so um, I'm glad Apple learned this lesson and they're fixing it. And I wonder if there are going to be new MacBook Pros. Of course, we mentioned that um, uh, the rumor is there'll be a 16 inch. I want a 22 Pro. inch. Yeah. 22. Oh, that'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, just throw it in a big. Was, how, how big is yours? Your your computer there, Leo? 30 inches. This is so 30. Yeah, this is the 30 inch so iPad that's I'm using 30, here. 30 is yeah. too much. I, I think 30 is too much. Alex just wants to. Alex just wants to wear a MacBook like on his back, like Captain America's shield. <laughs> I have to say, I still we still miss the 17. The 17 was a great. Oh, that was nuts. It was. It was. But a this great, would be a 17 in a 15 inch and chassis. It's exactly. Like, the GPU. Yeah. The G and if the 16 inch has the same s screen size as the 17, it'll be great. The Close. GPU on the 2017, or the, I'm sorry, the 17 inch GPU is still better than most MacBooks. So it was I, NVIDIA, we, right? What? Wasn't it NVIDIA still back then? It was still NVIDIA back then, yeah. It was NVIDIA chip, and it is yeah. still better than the crap that comes in the MacBooks now. It, it is a great idea, given how on point all of uh, Apple's pro level Mac hardware tends to be with one exception in my opinion but imagine them making a 17 inch style macbook that says pro people that just need something that they can put in a hard case <laughs> deploy when they get to the when they get to the venue and have really a full <laughs> a full screaming demon setup with no compromises yeah. uh, we didn't we didn't decide to delete something because of because uh, because of thinness we didn't decide to, to change something because gosh this thing that needs to have a 12 uh, 12 hour battery life uh, imagine how good a MacBook could be if they simply decided the performance, and if that it's, if they simply decided this is more of a portable solution than uh, than a mobile solution, so I, to speak. So I have I, just, I have I, been known to walk by and say iMacBook Pro until the point where people want to shove me. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep saying that until they actually <laughs> want to shove it out. MacBook Pro. I just I, or an I I just yes. I still think the market. It's an enough. iMac an iMac Pro that you can unfold and take with you. Yeah. Oh. I think I think that I. Uh, my problem is, as a pro who would definitely want one of those laptops and would be so happy if I had one, I just know I I've limited my my uh, expectations. Uh, the market's not big enough to make that work. Yeah. But you and, see, like Marquez travels with his iMac Pro in a Pelican case because he's not he's I not see, he can't render fast enough on a MacBook. Pro I see anymore. people I see people at the at the Starbucks with their iMac. I'm like, really? That's you like brought <laughs> iMac? There's the, I'm That's not just, kidding. Like every well, day, like leather, there's carry all right. They, people like advertise piles up leather carrying pouches. I, I like but the iMac. I don't even take my laptop to the Starbucks anymore. I have I take my <laughs> iPad. I, it's like the the laptop's like, oh, I'm pulling out How the tank. How much faster? Surface? If you had a top of the line uh, MacBook Pro, the i9, and maybe even an eGPU, wouldn't that be as fast as a Ma iMac Pro, or maybe not? Well, he, he said, well, he's got the 18 core with like the the giant GPU in it, so yeah, it's, he's it's, he's it's still doing it in hours instead of overnight. So he's carrying mm -hmm. around in a Pelican case a fifteen thousand dollar computer. <laughs> <laughs> He's not taking it to Starbucks, though. I mean, it's just... Yeah. No, we used to have, yeah. we used to have, there, we used to have lot, laptops like that. I mean... I mean Leo takes desktops. his Surface to Starbucks. Look at him. Yeah. So comfortable. Very happy. Well, there's a, there, there's a lot of room for for different interpretations. At CES, I'm, I've been trying to remember who manufactured it, but someone, uh, some company that's known for like really high-performance gaming machines had... Uh, it was a very large screen. It seemed like a 
17 inch or 20 inch display and it was again not designed necessarily for mobility but for portability and it had like a microsoft surface style sort of flap on the back so that uh obviously it's not designed for like multiple sort of positions but it meant that instead of having like an imac style built in a built-in stand that would never fold flat this thing when you fold it down uh could actually become uh, a uh, a self-contained package including a stand and protection for the keyboard so that if you were to zip it inside like a folio case or something and this is something you could easily take on board an airplane and there's some great uh, and so there's some I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that anybody should do that but it's an interest it's an interesting way to, to address a section of the market that wants a desktop that they can easily take from job to job to job and there's some great customization you can take that that arm off the back and um, you yeah, know, just the nub. It's, it's a and visa mount there. Right? It's not a v. Uh, it's not. I don't know if it's a visa mount, I, but it's on the Mac. iMac it is. Yeah, and, and so anyway, you can take that off, and then you can do all kinds of things with it. And and there's some great arms and great uh, customization that you can do with those things. And that's the problem we have is that when we we have all these monitors and we we don't know where the legs are. You know, because it, it's just like, it's all we use is, is a Keep stand. the legs. Yeah, they're with no, the no, box. They, Where's we, the box? The two, I don't things, know. the two things we can't find are the legs and the power supplies because we don't buy monitors anymore that don't do figure eight or C13. And so... Uh, so the, um, and then we don't keep the legs. And so there's all these monitors and you can't find any power supplies or any, any legs. Cause, <laughs> cause we're just like, well, you can just go anywhere I and buy a figure dream. eight. I'd love to have, I have a three monitor set up at home. I'd love to have it all on arms. It is I the way to lift go. It up, clean my desk, put it back down. They make ready. a lot of those. I might do that. Yeah. Those are, there's a, there's one company that I think still has a video of me reviewing it on like five years ago on their website. I can't think of their name right now, but, uh, uh, that has like the really shiny, nice ones. Yeah. And then yeah. But we, we buy a lot of cheap amazon ones that are if you're if you're great. dwayne johnson you could just put like a a gorilla pod at the back of the imac and just carry it around like a <laughs> selfie can um let's take a break when we come back there is a lot more to talk about i we you mentioned folding i think we should talk a little bit about the rumors that apple apple has a patent for a folding phone and 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 uh, apparently gorilla glass or corning is working on some sort of glass that will fold apple apparently doesn't want to do a plastic folding phone maybe there'll be a folding imac who knows our show today brought... <laughs> it's possible, right? It'd be a lot of folds. It'd be like a map. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by this little doohickey. I love my Eero. Eero knows that the single router model that we grew up with with uh, Wi-Fi is, is broken today because we have so many devices. The, the, the bandwidth is congested now. Uh, we live in a high bandwidth world, so you need to go... Mesh. It's simple physics, like white waves. Wi-Fi waves don't go through walls well. You wouldn't want a light bulb in your living room to light your master bedroom. What you need is a distributed system. In fact, for years, businesses have done it this way, but usually you need an IT professional to configure it and keep it running. Eero gives you an enterprise-grade Wi-Fi system in your home, and it's so easy to use. The Eero app will literally walk you through the process, iOS or Android. It lets... Once you've, you've set it up, though, you'll continue to use the Eero app because it lets you manage the network from the palm of your hand. I can do it from right here. Not only my network, but my mom has Eero. I set her up with Eero. I can manage her network. You'll know how many devices are connected to any given point, the internet speed you're getting from your service provider. And with Eero Plus, you can do so much more. It's a simple design, reliable security system that defends your devices against a growing number of threats malware, spyware, phishing attacks, and of course, unsuitable content. If you've got kids in the home, you're going to love Eero Plus. Eero Plus, Eero Plus provides complete protection for your network, your devices, and everybody who uses them as they connect to the internet. Block malicious and unwanted content across the entire network. By checking you sites you visit against a database of millions of known threats, Eero Plus prevents you from going to malicious sites by accident, and yet it doesn't slow you down. Plus, Eero Plus automatically tags sites that contain violent, illegal, or adult content. So you could choose what your kids can and cannot visit right in the Eero app. I am a happy Eero Plus subscriber, always have been. Not required to use Eero. It's nice to have that as a feature. Eero takes the problematic Wi-Fi. The, uh, the shout I used to hear in the house is, Honey, the Wi-Fi's down. I haven't heard that lately. Thank you, Eero. I really... Really appreciate it. 
Uh, and if and you know as, as you as your needs grow, you can grow your Eero system. It starts with the Eero base unit, connect that to your cable modem or your DSL modem, and then extend it with beacons. And you can add more beacons to extend it even farther. As I got cameras, you know, security cameras outside the house, I actually got an Eero beacon for the garage so I can make the Wi-Fi easier for those external devices to reach. It's really great. WPA2 encryption and really important, very important, constant firmware updates. Eero keeps on top of security so your router is never out of date, never insecure. And they say that they'll be able to do firmware upgrades to WPA3, the next generation of encryption too, which is awesome. Eero updates automatically. You don't have to go out and check to see if there's a new firmware. It does it automatically. And it does it frequently. I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I see new, new Eero firmware versions every few weeks. And if you ever have a question, they have amazing customer support. You can call and get a Wi-Fi expert instantly within 30 seconds. And uh, I've used it. And I just I, I made up a pretext because I've never had a problem with my Eero. And they were great. They stayed online with me through a fairly complicated port forwarding question until everything worked. I was so impressed. Never think about Wi-Fi again. We're going to get you a great deal, $100 off the base unit. Uh, but the, the package comes with the base unit and two beacons and a year of Eero Plus. You get $100 off when you go to Eero.com slash MacBreak and use the code MacBreak at checkout. If you've been suffering with Wi-Fi, it's time to get Eero, E-E-R-O dot com slash MacBreak. Use the code MacBreak at checkout to get $100 off the Eero kit. You're going to want this. It is truly awesome. Thank you, Eero. So uh, patent filing, I don't take much, put much stock in patent filings, but patent filing for a folding phone. But one of the issues with folding phones is all of the folding screens from Samsung, TCL, Huawei are polymers, they're plastic. And there's a real concern about wear and creasing. And I have a feeling, you know, six months into in, we're going to see these multi-thousand dollar phones with ugly lines down the middle and all sorts of things <laughs> yep apparently apple's you looking think that at, crease is bad now <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> apple's looking at glass and the folks at corning who make gorilla glass make apple's glass for their iphones said yeah it's a this is a you know a tough physics problem but we are working on flexible glass they call it willow glass that can bend and still be durable, reliable, and not have the problems polymers. I am have. I am really excited about this and really ready to let it spend about a couple of years. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. what you're doing. That's, <laughs> the good news Especially. is lowered expectations. The Corning CEO said, that, and it's going to be a couple of years at least. Well, even, yeah. even I mean, a couple of years after flat. they release it. I, like, I want to yeah. see yeah. what this phone looks like. Uh, same with the Samsung phone. I want to see what it looks like a year in or a year and a half in because... <laughs> I don't know if that's really going to work. Not not only that, but things things like uh, time. It's it's February or March, and you've been home for about an hour. So, oh, that's right, I left my phone like in its holder in the car, <laughs> and you're feeling and it's really really cold. You know what? Maybe I don't want to fold this until it gets back up to like sixty degrees because it folds nicely in in Southern California any time of the year, but. Oh, well, that's yeah, a good. I never even, even thought of that. Yet. Like, if you look at the willow glass, it's bending a little, but it's not folding flat the way the plastic does or a brick So does. we're talking about an Audi, yeah, yeah, an <laughs> Audi screen, yeah. And uh, I and I get it. I, mean, I think that they're they're going to sell enough of them because there's enough people like me that would buy them just for the conversation piece. If I didn't already have a hydrogen, that is that's my conversation piece. I don't I don't need that. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell What's you that weather? conversation oh, like. Oh it's great. God. What's wrong with you? Why do you have that phone? No, it looks, no, it's no? it's it's the three D photos are amazing. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll show I'll show yeah. you some. I've seen so, them. I got better ones now. So oh, okay. anyway, I've got I've been shooting with it a lot. Well, I now I have two because you know I bought the titanium, so they sent me a free. Aluminum one because the titanium one was late, so now I have that's two nice. Going around and, so you and, put uh, them in a you put them in a case and you've got a foldable tight a foldable hydrogen. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. There no, it's go. so it, the thing is is that it's 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 a fun it's a fun piece to you know kind of chit chat about. Um, so I get it, but as a as an operational phone, I think it's a horrible. But idea. I can see yeah. the value. I can see why people are interested in folding phones because imagine a phone that's not much bigger than your existing phone, but when it unfolds, you have a nice seven. You have an iPad Mini in effect. 
I just don't know how yeah. it survives. Like I just no, it, I agree like with the you. physics part of part Huge of my concerns head is just about like, where. No, I know. Mm-hmm. If I only well, wanted it for a couple weeks or a couple months, it works to show fine off, on Westworld. I don't know what you guys are worried. About. <laughs> but also, but also, don't you know, don't get fixated on phones. Like, imagine how cool it would be to have like a conventional like 13 inch MacBook that you can actually fold and to and actually make it purse size or even back pocket size. Uh, imagine having an iPad that works that way. It would be. Uh, Imagine again having the full fe- full flexibility, so to speak, of a large uh-huh. screen device flex- for your first you know, for your whole day for, your, for basically for whole for all day work, but not having to put it into a big laptop bag, being able to put it into a purse or just a a little little satchel. Flexibility excites me a lot. Folding, not so much. You know, like like I like I I'd love to have you know if I was working, I would love to have an arm like a Thor, like you know, or, or like a like That's a like a. Uh, making one. It's like a slap bracelet uh, phone. Well, like a, a, I yes. think of it as like a <laughs> like a quarterback on, on playing NFL. Like it's six inches long and it it's on there. If I was working, that would be amazing to be able to just be able to look down and do something. And, I, it's and walk pretty away. clear from M- but, the World Congress last week that we're going to see all kinds of crazy form factors. As yeah. companies desperately try to find a way to get people to buy new phones. Right, right, right. And I don't think Apple's going to ever be the first to do a foldable phone. They, they like no. you, are waiting years to see what yeah. the long term is. That's all they do. All Apple does is yeah. they draft on everybody else. Right. They, they, they watch it, and then they, they pick a, oftentimes, you know, the, the watches we were out ag- for a long time do before Do we Apple agree that the folding phone is a good idea even? Do we even mm, agree on I'm that? I'm not sure. I think it's, I, it's it, super it interesting. It is a compelling idea that has not yet been implemented. Sorry. Yeah, implementation is the key. No, it looks like Renee and I, Renee and I are saying the same thing. Exactly it's a super thing, interesting yeah. idea. Really, I'm glad that Huawei is making one. I'm glad that Samsung is making one because over the next year, just like with Google Glass, just like with so many other early uh, products, we will find out what's good, what we like about it, what we can absolutely leave behind. Uh, and for, at $2,500, it's not as though... It's not as though the majority – this is a problem that most people are going to have to deal with. But again, the idea of ha- having the, the convenience of larger screens but and being able to make them portable that, so you don't have to make those sacrifices that you always have to make. Or even, or even that device that you've got in front of you right now, Leo. Imagine the ability to have a device that to, – to basically – travel with something that's a like an 11 by 17 sheet of paper but when you get to work you really do have that big screen device uh th- all these sort of things that could become possible especially given if if you're already spending three thousand dollars for this level of processing power if that were like a six hundred dollar premium and imagine a future in which uh they, they're not, in which these things are absolutely durable and you will not get like a decrease in contrast or a decrease in saturation at the point of flex that could be that could be really interesting. I actually think that uh, one of the things Samsung's done with Galaxy phones that nobody talks about that's very interesting is this Dex capability. Um, yeah, I have a. I'll, I'll be getting the S10, but I have a Note Nine. Uh, I'll get the S10 in a couple of days, 10, 10 plus. Uh, and by the way, you can buy a Samsung Dex dock, but it turns out it's a standard. So for twenty bucks on Amazon, I bought just a little dongle. You plug it in, and then it has an HDMI port. You plug in a monitor. It has a USB port, keyboard, and mouse. And if you have a 27-inch monitor, you just leave it at work and bring your phone around, and that's got all the data. And since I did buy the one terabyte version of the Galaxy <laughs> S10, it really is a computer, right? It's got every... It's 12 a, gigabytes eight, of RAM. It's a 12 yeah. gigs of RAM, terabyte of storage, eight, you know, Qualcomm 8, Snapdragon 855. That's pretty close to a desktop computer. It's certainly as fast as my MacBook Air. Well, for definitely for business applications, I think it that it might makes be a great a way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Especially, especially given especially given how, how like a, a imagine a like a Chromebook in the, in a pocket size form factor. Right. If, all, if all you have is a really good studly that's basically com- what it is compliance. Yeah. yeah, and that's it's that's but that's definitely the the space that Samsung has. Uh, pegged out for itself where they they're not really necessarily saying that you've got like the next generation features that you've got in an iphone maybe not not uh, the sort of style of an iphone but we there's people out there that really want the most powerful phone you can possibly get because they're actually going to use all the power that's in there those are the people who want a terabyte of storage they want an sd card slot uh they want to have a, want a, screen a headphone that, jack that, that <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly <laughs> <laughs> but but that but that's that's the that's their their signature and that's what they're yeah. really uh, marking about i'm glad somebody's know. out there doing that and by the way yeah. they sell more phones than apple does well and i think that i think that for all, for a lot of these uh, folks, a lot of the platforms, including Apple, 
one of the things I think they, they don't do enough of is empower developers to push the envelope of their hardware. Well, you made the interesting point because you said that Dex is great for business apps, and it's exactly right. There's no final cut. There's no logic. There's no pro mm -hmm. apps right. on that. Well, but, and it, but even for business apps, really pushing what, – what, what happens is there's this kind well, of chicken or Microsoft egg – Microsoft Office on it. it. Right, but there's a chicken or egg thing where – you know, you, you, when you develop apps for business, you dumb them down because you think everyone's going to have a crappy computer. And then, you know, there's, they come out with new technology. And the problem is, is that you aren't pushing the envelope of that hardware, doing the next cool things that could be done for those computers. You know, the, the, the I, iPhone and even the, this iPad can do so much that we aren't using. And you see it every once in a while, you open up some app that has all this 3d built into it and it runs seamlessly and you go, Oh, that's what everything should look like. But these, you know, Apple and all the other companies, I don't think are investing enough in training their developers, building the right libraries, you know, building examples that really help push people to use it. You know, like for instance, right now, you know, Keynote is great. It's what everybody uses for presentations in, 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 in my world, uh, you know, when you're doing actual presentations in front of people, large numbers of people, uh, but it's still 2D. Like there's no, and, and Apple has US, USD3, USDZ, uh, and but everything in, in Keynote is still is all a 2D animation. There's no 3D space, you know, sitting inside of it. And and that you kind think of Apple thing, should do that in house. Well, I think that I think that there's two things. I think one is is that um, pushing their own applications, their own business applications, you know, um, and adding those things into it. I think we're going to see that. I think that we'll see a new Apple, you know, the new iWork or whatever they call it now, uh, work uh, stuff. I think we're going to see USD, USDZ being added to it. And that's going to help kind of push people along like, oh, I can add 3D to all of this. I do think that Apple should buy should buy a, a, or build their own little kind of 3D development app. I think Apple might have painted themselves into a corner because... A thermal corner? <laughs> <laughs> well, they did that, we know, with a Mac Pro. But no, I mean, uh, there's still a niche product. So developers aren't attracted to it in the... By the, in the numbers that they are to say Windows or even Android oh, but, or iOS, and so the Mac OS doesn't get that kind of software. Well, I'm not talking about Mac. I'm talking about iOS. Oh, I mean, okay. I, you know, well, I think iOS that, is definitely a predominant platform. But, I mean, yeah, and, and iOS, the the stuff. A lot of uh, there's a ton of iOS developers. Why do you think uh, they're not doing the latest greatest stuff? It's because they don't. It's it's expensive to push the em, to push okay. the envelope, and I think that you know, and other companies do. I think invest more than Apple does. Apple kind of says, okay, we're going to build this great platform for you, and then they just expect everyone to, like to they, jump on it. It feels like they have a lot of. I mean, they they offer uh, you know X, X code for free, a very nice development environment. They, it seems like they have a lot of resources for developers. They work pretty hard to reach out. I don't think average. anybody does a does a great job of. Uh, educating developers on an everyday basis. You have a big, you have a big conference, you have Google IO and you have F8 and you have yeah. WWC and then you have, you know, great tools, but this is something that I think, uh, That's an you should be engaging, yeah. you should be engaging folks yeah. every day, Especially every young, young people, every week, every day. Cause they're, you know, na they're naturally going to want to develop for iOS anyway. Right. So now teach them to use the latest, but not even just young people, greatest. but anybody who like the, the, the big thing is, is that we have this huge gap of, we have, I mean, they made Swift. Isn't that part of why they made Swift? It's part of it. I think that there's still a huge gap between, and we talked about this on another show, but between shortcuts and Swift, there is a kind of a, a the middle ground, a middle ground yeah. of where I think something like a, a nodal composite, a nodal programming interface that is easy for the average person and stop thinking about it being, they have to be computer science folks, but really they have a problem they want to solve yeah. at home that they want to solve yeah. a business and they're going to develop it visually and then push it out. And I think that those are, those are some of the ways that uh, I know that with Quartz Composer, we pushed the envelope, the outer envelope of, of a Mac because we could just do it. We could just draw a bunch of stuff yeah. and start stacking things up and building things that were kind of amazing uh, without having to write a single line of code, you know? And I think that that's the, um, so they let that. go of Sal Segoyan. I mean, they had, there was kind of an opportunity there with Apple Script and Automator. And a little bit. I, I think that what I'm talking about is more graphics heavy, you know, you stuff like that. Because that's that's yeah. what's going to push the hardware. It's not, you know, well, not, you got, not the usability, I mean, but the hardware. I'll tell you what, you got kids learning that right now. I and mean, that's how you right. learn most of these. Most I was watching on 60 Minutes, they did a piece on code.org and right. teaching kids. And it's all, it's all like that. It's all graphical drag and drop. 
exactly. You know, uh, coding. So they're used to that idea. Because once that's the hard part of understanding how how do you set up all the commands so that they're all going to do what they need right. to do. Once you figure that out, then you go, okay, what is the snippet of code that does that thing? And then you start typing it in. Yeah. But it's hard to, to learn both of those at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, Apple, as long as you keep the focus, as long as, as long as you just keep the focus on here's what you want to make, and we're going to teach you how to make that thing that you want to make, make as opposed easier. to yeah. here's here's what as opposed to making it make, pretending that computer science in itself is a fascinating field of discovery for kids. Right, right. it is. Right, uh, at least my, engineers well, think it is. But no, I know I know what you're saying. It's not. It's a harder sell. And saying, oh, but look what you could do. Or solution-driven like engineering is, yeah. is something that yeah. the problem you get into with the, the people who are just engineers, uh, not just engineers, but engineers is they can get very caught up in the technology of it, yeah, of, we, of how to do it. it. Yeah, like like you and you dig into it, and you're just like, we think it's I super can, cool. I want to add this button because I want to add this button right. rather than I'm trying to solve a problem. Well, and, and you get a certain category of software as a result. Same reason you need diversity, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's all you know these white men. Uh, you know, who have a certain mindset and everything, re re you know, software reflects the culture that created it. Right. I just, I just, all, all I'll say is that I have, uh, but my proficiency in programming, my interest in technology is largely, I owe a great debt to electronic arts for putting such great copy protection on their games when I was a kid. Because <laughs> yes. the, yes. Reason, yes. the reason why I learned how to code, I went from basic to assembly language was there's got to be a way to copy this yes. game. That's yeah. how I learned how to use a hex editor. <laughs> um, one Where of our sponsors edit? last year or maybe the year before was a I thought a really cool security camera called Lighthouse sad to say Lighthouse is now defunct um, they yeah. had a camera that used uh, time of flight LiDAR night vision and a lot of AI to it was an Andy Rubin uh, uh, investment and uh, they had some really smart people from uh, the ARPA Grand Challenge and elsewhere to do this AI I used it. In fact, I wish I could still use it, but the servers have been turned off. What we didn't know when they, and by the way, they bought, they paid everybody back who bought a lighthouse, which I'm grateful to because I would have felt very guilty pushing that product and people then couldn't use it anymore. But fortunately, everybody got theirs bought back. Um, what we didn't know is in December, Apple bought all their patents, uh, including the AI patents, including the time of flight sensor patents computer vision based security system using a depth camera method and system for visual authentication method and system for using light emission by a depth sensing camera to capture video images under low light conditions speech interference for vision based monitoring system two way communication interface i think that should be speech interface not interference <laughs> two way i'm reading i'm reading this from 9 to 5 mac that must be a typo two way communication interface for vision based monitoring system these are all patents Lighthouse patents that Apple has acquired, which I think is really cool. Yes. Maybe a HomePod with a camera? Uh, anything that you want. like Because right now you can do Face ID up to about, I forget what they have, 15 centimeters or some. It's got oh, a very small depth of depth yeah. of face. But once you, and they've already got plans to put the lasers on the back cameras. Yeah. And whether it's, you know, for it's not really cross the room Face ID, but it's a cross the room object identification that Alex has talked about before where, you, or we talked about earlier with the cars, you start to be able to not only define the exact parameters of your environment, but the objects within it. And you're basically teaching the computer to not just see a photo, but to understand everything that's in the photo. Not like humans do, but in a way that makes sense to computers and all the really other well. stuff you want inside it. Like yeah. I could look at my lighthouse and I could say, hey, let me know when Lisa gets home and if let me know where the cats are. And it knew, I mean, it, and they weren't close. It knew it across the room, oh, there's a cat, there's a dog, there's Lisa. Uh, it, well, there's the kids. It knew. It was great. And a lot of these technologies uh, can identify you by your gait, by the way you stand. If you think about when you see one of your friends 100 feet away, then they are essentially a couple pixels for you. And you know, oh, that's Frank. Or, oh, that's whatever. Because of something that they're doing that is... Yeah. Frankish. That I, that, only that, Frank would do that. Only Frank does that, you know? <laughs> and, and so... Uh, the uh, but you you notice that well the, they're starting to get a lot of the AI is starting to get good enough where it knows who you are and also what your next behaviors may be based on you know just the the movement of your body and a lot of the lidar stuff the time of flight stuff is important to to figure that out very cool the U S government is imposing new restrictions on shipping charged batteries this is not for you yeah. getting on a plane but it will mean your next iPhone will not have a half full or even 
30% full battery. They're going to We saw that with the battery cases. They all shipped uh, empty. Yeah. 30 yeah. yeah. I just got uh, a wireless uh, thing for the HTC Vive. It it was dead. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah. I got I can't use it. I got to charge it up. It took a long time to charge it up. I was so bummed. Uh, yeah, batteries, lithium ion batteries will can be charged to no more than thirty percent. And this is also for for folks like me that do production. This is a pain. You know, like it's it's. it's I don't know if they're I, I get it. I get it. I'm not, whether I'm not you arguing. get on the plane, but it's it is going to change when you buy something. Well, it's it's you know it's not so much when you, we ship a lot of like hardware, and so in that hardware the batteries are too big for us to just put in our carry on. Right. And so you know they're UPS batteries and stuff like that, and right. and you and we have big signs on them exactly what kind, and we flip them, and there's a whole bunch of things that you do, and you drain them out and stuff like that. But you just we do things that are safe safety conscious, but it does. I get the I get the risk of of doing that, so I, I understand where they're coming from, and and a lot of the airlines have already made this against the rules. So I I got I just got rid of my away I have an away bag, and I just got rid of the battery because I just I just got yeah I, you know it's just too much trouble yeah. to deal with yeah. So uh, it's interesting. I didn't realize this, but it was Apple was one of the first companies to ship fully charged or mostly charged products before. I do remember that before then they would it was routinely that they would come uncharged. Right. And uh, Tony Fidel actually talked about this at a TED conference in 2015. Uh, he said, I learned from this from Steve Jobs that you have to uh, think about the consumer who has never experienced your product before. And Jobs insisted designers uh, think about what it would be like to open a new device with a dead battery. It's a bad first impression. He, he talked about shipping a product with a charged battery. And only a few years ago, it was all too common to unwrap a new MP3, MP3 player with the glee of Christmas morning, only to find out we had to wait a few hours to charge the device. Now Apple products come at least partially charged. Well, 30% will be the max, but that's not Apple's fault. Yes, remember, it's important to get that initial dopamine hit right away. <laughs> the, sooner they, the sooner they set that up, the, more, the sooner they could be buying apps. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, a I good mean, point. That's a big to, Christmas we, day we, and uh, New we Year's want Day. We big make days sure for buying apps. Users happy. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's reasonable. And it did make a big difference. Yeah. It's a minor thing. But I'm sad to see that that won't be the case anymore. Yeah. Apple, uh, we talked last week or a couple of weeks ago about Apple getting a little heat on their a shot on iPhone campaign. Because they didn't explicitly say they would pay for the fit photos, they later said, "No, we will. Of course, we will. We just we didn't think anybody care, you know would care, think about that." The sh the uh, pictures have been selected. The ten winners will be featured on billboards in select cities. The uh, judges included uh, Obama photographer Pete Souza, Phil Schiller. I guess he's a pretty avid amateur photographer, and others. Here are some of the winners. This is uh, a beautiful. Uh, picture of uh, architectural picture. It must be Miami, right? What? Where else could it be? No, I think that's yeah, international. There, uh, uh, oh, there's yeah. a huge yeah. international uh, spread here, which is yeah. which I think is excellent. Um, here is a shot that Phil Schiller particularly liked. Let me let me squinch it down a little <laughs> bit of a raccoon looking down a log. And she, of course, one of the reasons they pick them is because they're beautiful shots. But the other one is they're shot on iPhone and they show off iPhone features. In this case, HDR. Schiller says it's a nice use of black or white, and and it couldn't have happened. Actually, it was Austin Mann who said this image took a lot of patience, great timing, and with the iPhone zero shutter lag and smart HDR, we'll able to, we're able to see both the raccoon's eyes and the deep shadows inside the log. That's actually a really good point. That would be a hard shot to get without HDR because mm -hmm. you yeah. got to figure the raccoon's got a lot of light around him. The log is very dim and dark, uh, but it really is a great shot. Yeah, I, I bet a lot of these weren't even manipulated a lot via right. on, on desktop apps. I, right. I bet that these were close to straight out of the camera. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love it if they mentioned that, but I would not be surprised if these were just a few sliders in the actual photos app, if anything. Yeah. Um, here's, uh, I'll show you my favorite, which is a puddle reflection. Yeah. It's, it's a, so good. Isn't that good? It's yeah. a heart shaped puddle. And this is the kind of thing that uh, it's really serendipity. Unless you're sitting there for hours waiting for somebody to walk across just right, which I doubt. Well, you just no, happen to get no, that. No, then you realize it's I, upside down. I, right. I'd that's be, the key. No. In fact, can you flip that, Karsten? I don't know if you're able to do it. But if you turn this upside down, you'll see the actual as shot. Look at this. This guy has all Whee! the tools. Uh, there's Now it makes more sense, right? That, that At the top is the woman walking and then yeah, her reflections yeah. in the puddle. 
but the the photographer is brilliant. Uh, well, Dina, can, I, can, can, can I tell you that the, the most encouraging thing for anybody who wants to be a really good photographer is when you get to see the contact sheets of every single yes. like iconic image. Henri Cartier-Bresson, who has these beautiful like slice of life moments, you say, oh, he really, really did just stand there in front yeah. on the top of that staircase no, wait. waiting for the exact <laughs> right combination of people yeah. to happen to walk by. It takes so, You have I'll, to have I'll, a good previs, the ability to pre-visualize what's going to happen. A lot of yeah. patience. And a lot of photos. And a lot of photos. Magnum, yeah. at one point, Magnum did a photo uh, uh, show that, that toured around that had all the, many of the very most, it's a, it's a photo agency, some of the most famous iconic pictures ever on the contact sheets. And it was great to see these iconic, you know, um, Yoko and John iconic picture with all of the much less iconic images. Yeah. Uh, you're right, Andy. That's a real eye opener. And it's encouraging for any photographer to see that, you know. We only see the cake that's perfect, not the one that, was left out on the ledge. Anyway, beautiful shots. If you go to Apple's uh, newsroom, you can see all of the 10 uh, winners. Some black and white, some color. All amazing if you think about it. This was done with a camera phone. Right. I mean, yeah. holy cow. Well, I think that I think that in the 60 Minutes thing, they listed that I believe there's 200 engineers, at least there were a couple years ago, 200 engineers just working on the phone camera. Yeah. You know, like just just making sure that camera is getting they're getting the most out of the physics of it. Um, they've got a lot of large staff. <laughs> I think on. Apple's smart too because you might you might say, oh, you know, the Pixel Three has technically a better camera. The Galaxy Ten has technically a better camera. Apple's smart to emphasize the art, the emotion, the feeling. The because results, yeah. Honestly, uh, yeah, maybe you get better night sight on a Pixel 3 XL, but you, I've never seen better shots than I've seen on the iPhone. So somehow, yeah. there's something about it. It just is able to get these incredible this is, shots. And, yeah, and, and this is why uh, reviews that go to like these real pixel peeping sort of, hey, we've magnified this a thousand percent so you can see the grain, really misses the point. It's not just the, it's not just the quality of the JPEG that you're getting out of the phone. It's also... How fast was this thing able to take that picture? When you stabbed your, when you suddenly saw your kid doing something adorable, and you, how fast was it between getting the phone out of your pocket to getting the camera app in front of the screen to stabbing your phone on top of that circle and getting the picture? Was there any sort of a lag? Was there any sort of a pause or a delay? Uh, where you did it give you a feature where you just held the, your, your your thumb down on that thing and it took a million photos in one second and then pointed out the three that were actually very very good. This is these are the things that the iPhones do exceptionally well. Uh, and that's why it will always be at the very, very top of basically the maybe uh, a tied at worst tied for tied for uh, first place uh, amongst two or three people. It's just these little things that make it into a great, great, great camera. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a break. Your picks, folks. Prepare them as I tell you about my pick for a VPN. I know more and more people are aware of Ooh. the value of a VPN for protecting your privacy, uh, for protecting your security. And the real challenge is you go out there, if you Google VPNs, there's thousands of them. And the vast majority of them, and don't be tempted because they're really low priced or cheap, but the vast majority of these are junk. They're not protecting your privacy or security. Uh, there's some of them insert ads into your stream you need a good company, a company that protects you by not logging your activity. Uh, ExpressVPN is it. Number one on tech radar. That's that's votes from actual users. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. It's not the cheapest VPN out there, and I know that. And then you don't want it to be because, honestly, it's expensive to run all the servers that they run and make sure they all have enough bandwidth so that the VPN doesn't slow you down. You know, that, that is not something you can do inexpensively. So any VPN that's free or cheap, there's a, there's, they're making money on you somehow or their service is going to be terrible. ExpressVPN is awesome. Less than $7 a month. You get the same ExpressVPN protection I use every day. It is fantastic. They are uh, not owned in the United States. So that's good too. <laughs> I think there's some people who are looking for that. But they do have servers all over the world and that means you also can get around if you're worried about that you can get around um, what we call geographic restrictions it's very very handy to be able to emerge in the uk or in singapore if you want to 
watch content on TV from those countries, for instance. Plus, it's encrypting everything. So the, you know, the guy in the hoodie in the coffee shop next door is not going to be able to see what you're doing. It's easy to use on every platform. They have apps for Mac, Windows, iOS, and Android. And these apps are easy to use. They run seamlessly in the background. One click, turn on, one click, turn off. So when you say, oh, I think I'm going to be safe right now. That guy looks a little shady. Boom, you are. ExpressVPN lets you safely surf on public Wi-Fi without being snooped on or having your data stolen or hacked. And I know a lot of people use ExpressVPN even at home because they don't want their internet service providers snooping on them. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three extra months free when you buy a one-year package. That's the best deal out there. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. And I was reading a news story. Where was it? Um, it maybe it was Turkey. Uh, the government seized ExpressVPN uh, servers because yeah. they were trying to track down a dissident. There was nothing on them. They couldn't do anything with it. So if you, I mean, they, you know, a lot of companies might say, well, we protect your privacy. We don't log. But we got proof. <laughs> ExpressVPN does does not keep track of what you're up to. It's a good company. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. Andy, your pick of the week. Uh, hopefully, hopefully a fun one for people. Uh, I decided that uh, I needed to have a Rubik's cube after oh. <laughs> being, being a kid of the '80s, and you, largely I bought it because it's. I was just curious about them, and then I found out that these are just such good fidget devices. Uh, and if you have like, if you buy like a modern one where they round off some of the corners in there, you can really just play with this in one hand like all day long. Uh, so uh, my part one of my two part pick of the week is the D. Fantix Moyu Weilong GTS version two three by three speed cube. Apparently, they you have to call this a speed cube and not a Rubik's cube if it's not actually made by uh, made by the fine people at Rubik's cube. Uh, and it's again just such a fun thing to. Uh, it is it is like my 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 favorite fidget at the moment. It it is always like on my desk or like I've actually been. <laughs> I've actually been playing with it through this entire uh, this entire show. I hope you bought kind of the. Uh... The Maru Lube Speed Cube Lubrication. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm not going to make that joke. It's, uh, it's high quality lube for your puzzle cube. I saw Spider Man Noir playing with one in the movie, and I just had to have one. You have yeah, a, you have a Rubik's. Both the, this is the funniest recommendation ever. Yeah. And, and to make. Th Who doesn't have a Rubik's and Cube? To, I don't have a. Yeah. Oh, actually, I do in my. Uh, the ones that I have trouble with are the 4x4s. Four like, I don't know what it Those is about the four easier. by four. Oh, no, yeah. no, no, not two by two, four by four. Oh, it's got an extra right. round. It's got an extra row, and for some reason, oh. my brain is like, I cannot do this. You know, it's like, oh, you see, you'll see there on YouTube. There are people who have made like these really weirdo like. <laughs> 20 by 20 cubes, 40 by 40 cubes, where they have to I make put these eight things. colors on the six <laughs> to mess with people. Yeah. It's weird, <laughs> but the the but the other but the other th the 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 uh, Mac and I Apple sort of twist of this is that uh, a really great app on the iPhone called Magic Cube Solver. Ah! Uh, there are now there are now really perfect algorithms for how to solve cubes and. 22 moves or less so if you want to like suddenly have this restored back to where it, what where it was before you can basically show it what this it doesn't use i don't believe it uses the camera but you can easily like uh, show it what they program in like what your cube looks like and it will give you turn by turn directions the like G, like gps but the other cool thing about this that separates it from a lot of other cube cube solvers is that it will actually teach you what the algorithm is so if you want to like learn how to do this instead of just always having to turn to the app it will coach you on like why it's making them why you need to make the moves that you're that you're trying to make right now i'm just playing with it as a fidget but i kind of just i'm looking forward to at one point being able to solve these things so it does as and as you see it will solve the four by four cubes the two by two cubes um there are other apps that will do like for if, if you're trying to do a speed challenge that's why i guess i guess that's why they're calling them speed cubes now uh because there are people who are trying to do it in less less than 18 seconds less than 10 seconds there's a blindfolded record there's a one-handed record uh but again as a this isn't just simple nostalgia i think it's an it's an interesting mathematical uh, theoretical device, uh, and the fact that I like to play with it like a toy. I think in grade school, I got, I got, I got under thirty seconds, but but I, I can't Any remember cube? now. Yeah. 
Uh, any any three three by three. Wow. Four by four now. Yeah. No, I can't do that. When I when I was in school, I solved it once, and that was largely by dumb luck. And I was so excited that I had to buy another cube because I didn't want to mess up the one that I solved. <laughs> do they I, come we had an hour unsolved? Do they come solved? solved? Nope. They come they come solved, and okay. eventually you play with it and it becomes like this. Yeah. But there's a there, there are a bunch of really nice apps. If you if you want to experiment with other apps, that's fine too because they both they all do things. It's fun when you watch it. It'll quickly get a 22 move so, uh, solution because mathematically it will never take more than 22 moves to solve a cube. But then you will see on other apps I have. You see it will continue to grind, 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 grind and try to brute force it. Oh, I found a 19 move one. Oh, found a 16 move one. And you kind of like, I know that I'm not connected to AC power, but I really want to see this. I really want to run down this entire battery trying to see if it can get how, how small and efficient a solution it can actually make. Anyway, have you, I, have you I, seen I, the uh, world's fastest uh, Rubik's Cube solver made from Lego, Mindstorms? Oh, yeah, God, I've seen that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, Two seconds. See, automation is going to take away so many jobs. <laughs> this is this is not all automation. those professional cheese, Rubik's Andy. cube solvers are now screwed. It starts so with this and ends up with the matrix. Funny. That'd be the kind big, of the fun big, code to write the uh, the code to solve oh, yeah. Rubik's cube. Yeah. No, because uh, uh, I'm picking this one because uh, this app because I think it's uh, it, I think it's the, the the nicest combination of features. But there are other ones like there's an Android app that I have that is really nice and that you literally just show it. It will use the camera to just dice to, to basically analyze the cube and then from there actually go on its own. Uh, it's it, it is and and you can watch mathemat. There's like all kinds of mathematical videos explaining principles. <laughs> about it really I, I honestly honest to god i bought this because i had like a whole bunch of amazon like gift credits from uh, from black friday that came in last month and i i like to spend that those credits on like fun things i said oh wow rubik's cube haven't had one of those before i'll, I'll get one of these and now it's like I'll, I'll it's at least five percent of what i'm thinking about over the course of any given week it is it is quite addictive and no batteries required alex how about a pick from you sir I got some new headphones. Getting my wallet ready. Uh oh. <laughs> so I got these. these getting my are, wallet ready. These are uh -huh. actually just getting released today. I think. Uh oh. They sent them to me to take a look they at. It must be so good. They're they're pretty nifty. Uh, this is a Surge 3D, uh, and so they've got kind of a pseudo 7.1 surround sound. Mm. Um, and uh, and so these are. This was an Indiegogo. Yeah, India. Yeah, in India Go Go and. Um, they are right now, I think for the next month, they're like $89 or something oh. like that. And they're amazing, you know, at that price. And um, and I think that, uh, you know, basically they have this kind of, it really is the most immersive that I've put, headphones I put on to watch movies. That's how I tested it. I put it on and I watched Live, Die, Repeat or Die, Live, Repeat or whatever that, that and, and that surround sound happens to be really good. And I happen to know it because I've got a, system in my house and so I'm, I, it's one of the ones that I kind of tested on that and saving private Ryan and uh, it just really feels I suddenly realized how much I was losing on the plane listening with my airpods <laughs> you know just watching movies <laughs> it just it feels like it's all around you and one of the things that they added I thought that that was actually pretty useful they've got wired it's got bluetooth and they also have a little um, you know can noise canceling uh, uh, microphone that you can attach to it, but you don't have to keep it on there. And what's nice about that is you don't have to take it out and, um, you know, take off your headphones to answer the phone. Uh, you can just, you can simply just, if a phone call comes in, you can actually answer the phone with it. Um, it's not, I don't think that the, the audio, uh, I tested it. I, I called some fr friends. I, I called my, my Uber tester, Fred, Fred, if you're listening. And uh, we all decided that it's not as good as the AirPods as far as the quality of the audio, um, but it's still much better than me having to put nice over the head over the ear uh headphones on and then have to change them out when i want to talk on the phone and it worked perfectly uh for me and um so anyway so it's it's a uh, i thought that i think that i mean i don't think you can find better headphones at 89 dollars than these ones um and, and even i think that i'd probably be more tempted to listen to these than my bose so um so they're really really good good value right now um, and, uh, and it's just a really, um, really good sound. And I haven't had over the, I, I admit I don't use the, I have in ear almost all the time because I don't like to travel, uh, with over the, I don't like to use up the space, uh, in my backpack, but I'm actually now taking these along with, on flights because 
I suddenly realized what I was missing. <laughs> I was like, oh, it is a lot nicer when they're over your ears. And, and again, it, it, uh, you can also control the movie with the headphones. So you, if you have it sitting out there, you can tap on it and you can answer for calls and, and other things with the, uh, a uh, little bit more control than you actually have on your on your um, AirPods. So mm -hmm. um, it's a slick slick head, headset, um, and uh, again, I think it's an incredible value uh, right now. So if you're if you're interested in over the head, um, they're really into the the cushion. It is very comfortable. I, I had it on for hours and didn't realize that. Just forgot that they were on and just kind of was doing my thing and suddenly realized I had headphones on. Their Indiegogo I, started today. It looks like. Yep. That's awesome. Can I can I tell you how much I agree with you on that point where there 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 was a rare time when I was on a train and I decided to just toss my regular headphones like in a bag and only then did I realize that wow, I I keep wearing these in-ear earphones earphones for convenience, but my goodness, the sound, the music oh is gosh. so much nicer and the movies are so much nicer and I don't have to like after 2 hours I don't have to like unplug one ear and give it a rest because it's starting to like sort of nudge on me. Yeah. And so that's why that's why that's what finally got me to buy like one of these hard cases for my headphones because I right. want to now have the option of taking these. I I had no idea how much joy I was denying myself by <laughs> by not taking Taking like real headphones with me when I travel. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 definitely something that uh, I hadn't I haven't had it for a long time. You know, I kept on buying bows and losing them somewhere, and then I didn't like to pack them and, and everything else. And so I I I was being too utilitarian. And uh, when they uh, when I saw these go by, I, I pinged them and they they sent again. They sent me some, and, uh, yes. and I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, I am going to use these a lot. I so. like to see an Indiegogo where they actually have made some. As opposed to exactly. many yeah. Indiegogos I've invested in where they never did make any. Yeah, they, so. they made them, and they work. Renee Ritchie, your pick of the week, my friend. Yeah, so my pick of the week is something that I've, I've been wanting to do for a while, and that was to take my YouTube videos from 16 by 9 to 2 point to two by 1 because that better suits the aspect ratio of iPhone 10, Galaxy S. You know, all, all the new flagship phones are big and tall. Uh, you know, Sony is ridiculously so now. But the 16 by 9 were just putting too much pillar box on the side. So I wasn't sure how to do it. I asked Jonathan Morrison, who's a really well-known, really – beautiful YouTuber, makes absolutely gorgeous videos, and he convinced Marquez Brownlee to do it. So I asked his advice. I've been working on it for a while. I finally have a workflow that I really liked, and I was starting to get asked about it. So I decided to make a tutorial that shows how you get your footage in, how you you know, I still shoot in 16 by 9 because I want the extra pixels. I don't want to throw them away. But this shows you how to how to get the the two by one project, how to fill it out so that you don't have the pillar boxes, how to adjust it if you need to, how to deal with legacy plugins that aren't shaped for two by one that are still 16 by 9. So they they stop short of the edges, different ways to fix those, and also just little tips. And uh, Jonathan was nice enough to add some tips of his own. Uh, towards the end of the video. So if you use Final Cut Pro and you're at all interested in two by one, two colon one, two aspect ratio one video, then this will walk you through the, the entire process from beginning to end. I'm just so glad you're not talking about one by two. That's no, no, Alex. <laughs> and shout out to Judd who's there in that video. He does all the awesome video stuff at Apple. We just, we get... We get that request and you're just like, mm. the, the only thing worse than one by two is one by one. <laughs> yeah. What is one by two? What would that even look it's like? Real, it's, it's not really one by two. It's, 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 it's nine like by Instagram. It's not the, TV? the six, nine by 16. It's like the vertical for Instagram and, and, and snap and everything else. People want to do videos long. I and thought Instagram was square. Here's, here's what I would say is that it actually, if you're talking, if, it, if you're just a talking head, it actually works better. I will admit. If you're just talking head, someone's going to watch that, look at their phone, and you're not one showing by two them anything. Is better. A one by two is better. Oh, that's vertical video, of course. Your vertical yeah. video yeah. is better when you're just a person talking to other people. Sure. It looks better. It's better for them. As soon as you want to show them anything, it becomes really yes, not great. Anyway, that's a that's great. I I, I didn't think about that. Do you do you take into account the the um the notch? Is that kind of like you think about what the dead space yeah, is? Yeah. So. Yeah, so I, I, you block that. Like by default, it won't go to the notch. It stops just short of the notch with two by one, which is what's nice about it. If you double tap, it will cut off a bit of the top and bottom. So I make sure to leave space for that and to make sure none of the lower thirds touch on that. Uh, and then I leave everything out of the 
out of the sides just in case. I mean, some people, I'm sure you can have fun with it, like patrol eyes or hair on it or something if you're smart enough, but <laughs> I just avoid it entirely. <laughs> Actually, everybody's complaining about the uh, hole punch on the galaxy because oh, but the wallpapers are so good. It's like they put like minion goggles yeah, on it, and they, it's uh, the wallpapers are amazing. They're having fun. Actually, I saw one that took a sideways iPhone uh, 10s, and because that not the hole punch yes. is, about the, is about the same as the camera. So the wallpaper has at the top an iPhone with the hole punch where the camera would be. Uh, yeah, that's a problem if you're trying to watch video, play a game, or anything. The hole punch is a notch seems a little bit better actually than a hole punch in that regard. They're all, I mean, we're all, they're all, we're just Nothing's biding time perfect. until we get the yeah. subscreen technology. Yeah. So do you, is everything in Vector now uh, two by one? Yeah, it's, it's all two by one now. I'm super happy with it. I mean, YouTube supports it natively. Final Cut Pro has native projects for it. Uh, there's just a couple workarounds. I said, like with the legacy plugins, if you know motion, you can just edit them in motion. Otherwise you can make them a compound clip, but I've been very happy. And it looks, it just, even Netflix, apparently Netflix is doing their new shows in two by one, like Stranger Things. And it's just, I think oh, it's going to catch on. Oh, I did notice It's like that. a sweet spot. Yeah. yeah, I did know. I thought that's kind of weird. On my TV, it's got bars, right? Because your TV is, is more like two point. We get a lot of movies that are like two, three, five, which is even nine more. Is really five more one. Yeah. That's even more dramatic. This yeah. is sort of like between two, three, five and, yeah. and 16 by nine. Renee Ritchie's Vector is at imore.com slash Vector. His writing's at imore. You must follow him. And, of course, that's where his article on how to make 2 by one with Final Cut Pro 10 is. Thank you, Renee, for being here. Really appreciate it. Always Thank great you. to have you. Alex Lindsay, uh, you can follow him on the Twitter. He's the pixel, the guy, the man from the Pixel Core, A-L-E-X-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Anything coming up? Nope. And then... <laughs> <laughs> other, than, other than me complaining about the Oscars, I think that was my... On Twitter. <laughs> well, you saw that Steven Spielberg said, That's I don't I think we should about. ever nominate anything that didn't uh, show cinematically in a theater. That's exactly what he's, I was talking he about. He wanted to change the rules so that Roma could not have been nominated. And I think he's so wrong. I think the bottom line is, yep. is that most of the viable movies uh, that for Oscars in 10 years are going to be all Netflix and everything else because no one's going to make movie. No yeah. one's going to make that kind of movie for big screens. Big screens are going to become... Sp events. They're Spielberg be... says that's not movie. That's made for TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because, of course, his first big movie was made for TV. But yeah. so salty. that's not He's the so same. Salty. Made for TV back then is not the same as Netflix exactly. today. Yeah, cause it, it would be an awful, awful thing if everybody who watches the Oscars had seen every single movie, including the documentary features that are nominated. Because the last thing we want is for people to be actually have that's an emotional investment point. in who wins. That's a very, very good point. Yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, the the danger comes back to Hollywood. If, if Hollywood actually did that, the smart thing to do would be to create another uh, award. Yes. Awards. The streamies. And then just, well, <laughs> and I, I wouldn't take the ones that already exist. I'd just build one and re yeah. redesign it for the online audience and, yeah. and recreate something. And within 10 years again, it would be, no one would be paying attention to the Oscars. Well, this anymore. is where the Golden Globes has a little bit of an advantage because they do TV, they do movies, they do whatever they want. Right, right, and right. I think it's actually a more representative you can, it's ridiculous to say, oh, we'll only uh, give an award to poetry written in blank verse. If it rhymes, well, we just can't. If it's iambic <laughs> pentameter, then yeah, no. Yeah, if it's not ambi yeah, iambic pentameter, yeah, nothing. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's just not, art is, doesn't depend on the medium. Art is art. Folks that are very connected to the old film school and the 2398 and all that other stuff is all, you know, they're just hanging on as best they can. I thought Roma was easily the most amazing movie of the oh, year. Oh, good. Really loved Roma. I haven't and seen it yet. It's shot. Uh, in fact, I, I was meaning to ask you uh, about it. It's shot in uh, digital black and white. They're using, um, six, what is it, Alexa 65 camera, which is an airy digital camera. Everybody uses the Alexa. Yeah, features. camera. In fact, features, I, yeah. yeah, I think, in fact, Stranger Things is shot on it. But uh, the black and white is beautiful. The tonal range, the quality is amazing. There's a milky... It's HDR. There's a milky kind of smoothness that the Alexa has that there's no other camera that i've shot on i, I my my brother uh is an snob like he will not like he, he mostly does really high-end uh work and so he's just like oh he just uses and i and i give him a hard time because i use my black magic cameras and everything else and but i will admit that there is a in good lighting uh the i don't see much difference between my black magic mini nurses and and his and his but uh in in movie film filmmaking uh 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So um, you can't call anyway. it the Alyosha. It's a camera. It's a camera. I'm not talking about that. So, <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so, sorry. What uh, can I do? I can't help you. So anyway, the um uh um anyway, so 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 the I like I it's, like it's a gorgeous. That it's just a gorgeous chip. It's a and, and they've, they've of, taken over. I, it's HDR black and white. This Roma, you got to watch it. It's, well, it's, it's on it's, an HDR well, screen. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. What. The HDR is basically what they're doing is they're shooting the can they're shooting the whole thing in what's called log, you know, an airy log is the the thing you're shooting at log which is a much wider uh, gamut, and then you convert that to HDR later. Right. So and and all films were kind of built that way. That's why they, all these old films can come out in HDR. Right, is because they were all the film response was typically a log uh, right. when it was scanned. It was a log right. uh, response, and so so that is the um, so you're just able to reconvert it back to PK twenty twenty and then into Dolby Vision or um, See, I knew I, I, you were things. the guy to ask. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> the other thing is, Quaron uh, was his own DP. My, my guess is DQ he was twenty twenty. By the way, he no, was DQ. carrying the Alexa sixty five and shooting it, so it's very cinema verite feeling. But he also does some very unusual framing. You, you as a film, no, buff, I, you I want to see it. I just haven't gotten my. He's a great director. Born films, I always have to kind of warm up to. Like, oh, I'm no, I movie. thought the same thing. <laughs> and and by the way, the first shot is six minutes long, and really slow, and it's gonna irk you well and, and but I get, then you're gonna kind of get it once i get into it like my uh my wife was watching um uh the dragon tat the girl with the dragon tattoo and i was like oh don't even like the, the swedish ones are so much better and like don't even bother with the american versions because the swedish ones and she was like i don't want to watch all the subtitles and, and then the as swedish soon as, ones were better and the yeah. problem is they're no longer on netflix so you have oh. to watch you have to watch one on voodoo and another one on oh. this you have to like bounce around finding like it's like this little they were truer pack. to the book too. you have to go you have to go to amazon yeah. prime and you have to subscribe to the horror thing for two dollars and then watch it and then immediately <laughs> cancel it you know like just, just to watch the girl with the dragon tattoo but it's they are infinitely better than i agree than the american versions i agree get in watch it on a, on a high quality i watched it on my oled hdr watch roma and uh you know on a high quality oh, set. Yeah. i think you will really appreciate Can't it wait. and it's and it's why i completely disagree with steven spielberg that movie was as artistic as any movie nominated this year it's rumored that they spent 150 million dollars on promoting it to get the oscars roma? yeah yeah that's what spielberg didn't like that's what it is yeah. that's what spielberg yeah. didn't like he said ah these these aravist you know, dot comers, they got too much money. I mean, it was seen as like, it was seen as, as, as uh, a bit gauche when Miramax spent 25 million promoting something, you know, is the, you know, now they're in a whole Shakespeare world. in love. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> right. But that was a great movie. Deserved well, to win. Wait until the, uh, wait until all the sports. No, contracts you didn't like come Shakespeare up. in love. I liked it. Yeah. yeah. yeah wait yeah. until you wait until all the sports contracts come up and uh, the, the, the Fang group just takes them all. You know, like you know, broadcasters can't compete now. Like That's they're, really they're true. They out so of their money. out yeah. of their league. Yeah. So the first one's the NFL in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Can't wait. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Popcorn, please. Oh, that'll be really interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, maybe, that's it maybe for I'll be able to finally see see Bob's Burgers at his appropriate time instead of 45 minutes delayed. <laughs> that's oh, Andy Anaka. Oh, oh, oh. Catch him Fridays, WGBH Boston, Boston Public Radio, and of course every Tuesday right here on Mac Break Weekly. Thank you guys for being here. We do Mac Break Weekly. We're going to uh, enter, finally, in the United States, we're entering summertime on Sunday. So uh, we normally shoot this uh, show at around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. That would be 1,900 UTC, but starting next week, it'll be 1,800 UTC. I think, if my math is correct. Uh, as we spring forward into right. daylight saving time, as we call it here. Oh Great God, I don't. I, I I am so ready for it still to be light out at five oh, or no. six p.m. Yeah. I'm so ready for this. This so, has been a very long winter. It has been, especially for you back east and you in Montreal. You know, we, we keep on having all these people talk about. Um, we keep on talking, having people talk about like this whole like jobs and the green promise program, whatever, in, in Congress. And all I want to hear about is how we're going to abolish daylight savings. Did that pass in yep. California? It passed, right? It, pa it opened the door to it. I it doesn't do anything, but it passed. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna change the clocks on Sunday. Don't forget, we'll be uh, at a different time. I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> Spring forward. We'll be an hour earlier. They're taking an hour away from us. Yes. Uh, just make sure you watch YouTube. Uh, it has a live stream. Twitch. To, actually, the best thing to do is go to twitch.tv slash live, and you can choose your favorite live video or audio. We have two audio streams as well. Listen and watch. And if you do that. If you're doing it live, go to the chat room. They're live also, irc.twit.tv. That's the true conversation Alex was uh, talking Great. about. Uh, you can watch On Demand, too, and pretend you're watching live. But that way it could fit into your busy life. 
And uh, you can get our show at the website, twit.tv slash MBW, audio or video. Best thing to do would be find your favorite podcast application and subscribe. We're everywhere because we're one of the, I don't want to say oldest podcasts in the world, one of the longest running in the world. <laughs> Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. But now you got to get back to work because break time is over. Yeah.